Okay, welcome back to TNS RV Adventures. And this is the second half of the Straight Talk About RVs Systems, 6 through 10. Now, I'm going to tell you, we are not experts at any of this. But we wish, when we started back years ago in RVing, that we knew some of this stuff. It would have been a whole lot easier for us. So, we're putting this together just to give you some information, maybe get you up to speed faster and, and make life a whole lot easier. <clears throat> so, excuse me, here we go with the second half with systems 6 through 10. Okay, here we go. The axles and the suspension. Okay. Depending on which kind of suspension system you have, you could have the traditional leaf springs or you could have the independent suspension. So we're going to talk about a little bit about both of them. And we're going to talk a little bit about cargo capacity and weight. Now, the the first thing you do when you get your RV is usually they'll come and, and they'll list what the unloaded vehicle weight is. And you're going to have what your gross vehicle weight is. Once you get all your stuff loaded into it, um, it's a good idea to take it to a cat scale like the truckers use to weigh their trucks. It's a good idea to take your RV to a weight scale and get what the loaded weight is. You take a look at that loaded weight and make sure you don't go over your gross vehicle weight rating. So that's the first thing to do. You don't want to overload these leaf spring suspensions. Uh, it's just not a good idea. Do some research on using the cat scales and, and you can find out just the procedure to go about doing that. In between the tires, you're going to have something that's called an equalizer on a leaf spring system. Now, those equalizers, depending upon the RV that you have, could be a solid equalizer or it could be a cushioned equalizer. It could be a Moride. Uh, it, it could be a, a, an Equiflex. Uh, there's several different kinds of them. But keep in mind, those have little rubber bushings in them. Uh, and you want to keep an eye on those to make sure they don't deteriorate. It's just something to keep in mind. Leaf springs also have bushings in them where the eye of the leaf spring attaches to the frame hangers. There's bushings in there, and they could either be bronze or they could be plastic, nylon, and there's something even called forever bushings. They don't last forever. And... Every once in a while, you, you've got to check those bushings. Now, the only way you can check them is to take it apart. And a lot of RVs have what they call wet bolts. They've got a little grease zerk fitting on the bolt head. And every once in a while, you got to get a grease gun and get in there and grease those bushings. Uh, it just depends upon how many miles you travel and, and how loaded you've got your rv as to how often you need to check those bushings like i said you can't see them the only way you can check them is to take your sp suspension apart and you got to have the right tools to do that because you got to take the weight off the rv so i check our bushings every year and the reason i do it at that is because i look at my wheel bearings every year to make sure the wheel bearings are still in good shape. And I repack the wheel bearings with grease. Now, while I've got them in there taking it apart, I might look at getting in there. 
I always grease them once a year and maybe even once a quarter. It just depends on how many miles we've put on the RV. Now, I've looked at our bushings. We've been full-timing in it now for four years, and, and I know my bushings will last a couple of years. But don't ignore them. Eventually, you're going to have to get those bushings checked and make sure they're still there uh, and, and in good shape. I mean, otherwise, you're going to have to get the bushings uh, replaced and, and new bolts, wet bolts put in. So they're just something to think about when you're down there inspecting your suspension system. Now, an independent suspension is a, is a different animal. And so look into the independent suspension about the maintenance items that, that you need to check. Just some things to think about with the, ax the axles and the suspension. The next thing you're going to be doing in looking at that is the brakes. Now, if you've got a disc brake system, then you're going to have a hydraulic system that feeds those disc brakes. And you're going to have somewhere in the front of the RV a reservoir with a pump. And in your truck, you're going to have or, or select in the braking system, electric over hydraulic. So that's one type of disc braking system. The other braking system that's been around forever is drum brakes. And this is the drum brakes, you know, they've had on vehicles forever. But every once in a while, you've got to, to pull the hub off, uh, the drum assembly, you got to pull that off and check the brake shoes to make sure they're still in good shape. Now, I do this every year when I pull the bearings out to repack them with grease. You've got it off anyway. You take that drum off and you can see the brake assembly. You, you wanna check the brake shoes on either side to make sure you've still got good meat left on the brake shoes. If you've got one that's wore down, you need to replace the brakes on it. So it's just something to think about on the braking systems. On the one hand, you've got the hydraulic disc brakes, and on the other hand, you've got the old drum brakes. But you've got to check those brakes every once in a while to make sure that they're still in, in good shape. And like I said, I check ours every year. So just something to think about with the braking systems. Also, tires. Now, there's been a big controversy in the RV community about tires. And some of these tires, you've heard about the blowouts and you've heard about the China bomb tires and things of that nature. I would read up on tires, right? I would also find out exactly what the air pressure for those tires, your individual tires, your specific tires in your RV, what's the recommended tire pressure for those tires? And usually it's on a sticker on the left side of the RV up front. But you have to also take into consideration the ambient temperature uh, that you're in. Now, in cold weather, you may have to add air pressure. But the closer you get to warm weather, hot weather, you may have to let some air out of the tires. And I would advise you to only do that when you've set for like, overnight or something. Check the air pressure in the tires and make sure it's at the recommended amount. Another thing I would talk to you about is consider a, an RV tire pressure monitoring system or tire pressure warning system. There's aftermarket systems out there. Uh, they're very good. Uh, there, there's one that's made by TST. Uh, there's another one, uh, Tire Link is, is another one, but there's several aftermarket tire pressure monitoring systems. And usually it's some kind of a sensor that you screw on to the valve stem on the outside of the tire, or you can actually put it inside the tire. But I would strongly recommend you look at getting a tire pressure monitoring system for your RV. Because let me tell you, if you get a flat tire, you may not know it because you can't feel it. You look in your rear view mirror and all of a sudden the whole side of your RV is getting tore up because you've got a flat tire. 
Now understand, a tire pressure monitoring system is not going to help you in a blowout. It cannot sense a tire about to blow. But what it can do is tell you if you have a slow leak, you'll see the tire pressure going down. And keep an eye on it because you need to pull over and find out if you've got a nail, a screw, or something like that on your tire. A lot of them will give you the temperature of the tire as well as the air pressure. And keep in mind, in the hotter weather, the temperature will rise faster. So our tire pressures, the maximum pressure, is like 120 pounds. Now, I put 105 pounds of pressure in our tires, even in the hot weather, because I know when we take off, it's going to expand the t when the tires get hot. And so they'll come up to 110, 115 PSI. All I'm telling you is read up on tire pressure monitoring systems, and, and I would strongly consider getting one. You know, I talked about a tire changing jack because these RVs don't come with one. And so you need some kind of a jack to change a tire when you got one to go flat, whether that's a ramp or whether that's a, a, an external jack with a jack stand that you can put right underneath of the U-bolts, right at the very end of the axle, right behind the tire, to jack that tire up and, and change it and put the spare on. Don't forget to look at your spare every once in a while, check the air pressure in it, and make sure that the tires are still in good shape. When you change that tire, understand lug nut torque, because you don't want to over torque those lug nuts. I know, and I've seen YouTube videos of guys that have used some kind of, of um, a torque wrench. Uh, and, and tightened up the lug nuts too tight and they actually broke them all off and the tire come flying off. So find out, usually somewhere on the RV, it'll tell you what the proper lug nut torque for your tires are. Look in your owner's manual. Read that owner's manual. But you want to use the proper torque on them lug nuts. You also want to look at the tires every once in a while to make sure that they're wearing even. You don't have any abnormal wear on them, like the outside treads wearing out or the inside or scuffing, that kind of thing. It can tell you that you might have some suspension problems. So just take a look at your tires and just keep an eye on the wear power pattern uh, on your tires. Now, tires on an RV typically will age out faster than they will wearing out. Now, what I mean by that is you don't put as many miles typically on your RV that you do your car or your truck. And so the tires will sit there, they'll dry out, they might get dry rot, they might crack, but it has plenty of tread left. Well, you're not so much concerned about tread depth as you are the age of the tire. Um, you'll find differing thoughts on how long you should keep a set of tires, but just check the tires, you know, get down there and look at them. If you see a bunch of weather cracks and, and those kind of things, change them because you don't want to have blowouts on these RVs. Uh, trust me. Now we've never had a blowout and we have, we're on our second set of tires. And we've got uh, almost 25,000 miles on our RV towing. So, read up on tires is all I'm saying. Okay, so I, I think we've been through the brake, brakes, the tires, the axle, suspension. Uh, take a look at your owner's manual. Get on these forums and read what they're talking about with these, these suspension systems. Uh, check your wheel bearings. Make doggone sure those wheel bearings are in good shape. Now, if you're not familiar with doing that kind of stuff, take it to a trailer uh, manufacturer. Not, you don't have to necessarily take it to an RV dealer. These places that actually build trailers, uh, they could be for a horse trailer or a dump trailer, but they know trailers. And so 
take it in there, have them look at, at your suspension. And if you need your bearings repacked, you need your brakes checked, that's a good place to do it. Now, I do all of our own work myself, but I'm getting to the point now where I don't like crawling around under the RV. My knees aren't what they used to be. But just take a look at this stuff and keep it in mind. So we've talked about the axle, suspension, tires, and brakes. So be mindful of these things and keep an eye on them. Okay? Uh, okay, we're going to be talking about the leveling systems here in a minute. But uh, it's the next subject that, that I've got. So hang in there. We're counting them down. Okay, one thing more on the braking system. Whenever you hook up and you pull out, you should do what's called a pull test. That is, when you've got everything hooked up and you're getting ready to pull out, you reach down on your manual brake selector there in your truck and, and pull on it. So you, you can feel that your brakes on your RV engage. That's what's known as a pull test. And you may have to reset the gain on, on your truck brake controller. One other thing to think about is the emergency breakaway system that you've got on these RVs. Now, that's the little switch up on the tongue or up on the pin box with the rip cord on it, you know, that if your truck and your RV separate, it pulls the pin out of that switch. And what that does is it puts full battery power from your RV to your braking system. And so it, it's, it's a good idea to check that switch once in a while. Now you can pull it out of there, pull the pin out, and you should be able to hear your brakes humming back there. Uh, but caution, don't leave that pin out very long because like I said, it applies full RV battery power to your brakes, all of them. And so you can overheat the wires and things on, on that braking system. It's there for emergency only if your tow vehicle separates from the trailer. But you got to check that switch once in a while. Um, I've talked to you about not pulling that pin out very long. Uh, the emergency breakaway system, the activation of it is totally separate from your other braking system with your tow vehicle. It uses the same wires and things back on the tires, right? And back on uh, the wheels and, and the brake pads and things like that. But the switch itself uh, is wired directly to your battery. And so when that pin comes out of that switch, it's supposed to set the brakes on your RV and bring it to a stop. That's its purpose. So just a word about the emergency breakaway system. Okay, we're back. <clears throat> now we're going to get into the leveling systems. You got two basic types. Some just have stabilizers, you know, where you, you've got a crank and you crank down your stabilizers and it just stabilizes the trailer. <clears throat> Usually on smaller trailers, they just have stabilizers. But you could also have a leveling system. Now, there are two types of leveling systems. There's electric and there's hydraulic. And our rig just happened to have electric system. <clears throat> and you're going to have a controller somewhere. Uh, ours is inside the cargo bay attached to one of the doors. But understand your leveling system. <clears throat> understand the proper operation of your leveling system. And you can read up in your owner's manual, and a lot of times they don't give you a whole lot of information in there, but read up on it. Understand it. Understand, too, if your leveling system has a problem, understand how you can get around the problem. Um, not necessarily bypass it, but be able to 
maybe troubleshoot it to understand what's going on. Now, if you've got a hydraulic system and you've got a leak in one of the hydraulic jacks, then it's going to cause your problems and you're going to have to fix that leak before your leveling system is going to work properly again. Also, you're going to have uh, a reservoir, usually up front in, in the front cargo hold will be your reservoir where your hydraulic fluid is stored and it runs to all of your jacks. The electric system, each one of the jacks in the electric system has a motor on it and there are levelers that keeps track of how level your system is. <clears throat> okay. Understand the menuing items on your controller and the steps you need uh, to do a level once you've unhooked. Now, once you've unhooked, you, you've put down your landing gear on a fifth wheel. You've pulled your truck away far enough. So if that knows that RV comes down, it ain't going to hit your truck. Now that's on a fifth wheel on a travel trailer. You've pulled the hitch lever and you've pulled it away. And now you go to your controller and, and you might just push one button and the thing levels itself. Understand your leveling system. Understand the procedures if you have to reset what's level because these things have a brain in them and, and they know that they get set with what is level. And sometimes that gets off. And so if there's a procedure to reset level, you need to understand what that procedure is. But you can read your operator's manual and it'll tell you a lot of information in there and just get to know it real well. Now, our controller, like I said, is in one of the cargo holds and it's got a, it's a menu driven system. And so you hit down arrows, up arrows, and it'll take you through menuing systems. And a part of that, it will show you what the battery voltage is because you want a good battery, good voltage in your battery to help this leveling system do its thing. If you got weak batteries, you might have a problem with your leveling system. And so on our controller, it shows us what the battery voltage is and it should, ours typically runs around 13.7, 13.8 volts. And that's kind of the float voltage that, that our converter is supplying battery charge to keep it charged up. Now, if I look at that monitor, and it tells me my battery voltage is like 12 volts, I know I've got a converter problem. So I can use my controller for my leveling system to just check on my batteries and see what they're at. But you're going to need good battery voltage for your leveling system. It's just some things to think about on your leveling system. Okay, the next system that I come up with is your air conditioning and your heating system. Now, in the first part, I've talked about having multiple air conditioners. Now, some of these air conditioners have what's called a heat pump, just like in your home, to help with keeping your RV warm. But you want to make sure that those air conditioners are kept clean. If they got filters in them, take them out and clean them. Uh, you want to get up on the roof every once in a while and check out your air conditioners and make sure that, you know, you don't have a bunch of leaves and, and stuff plugging up the air conditioner. And typically, if you have a heat pump system, one of the air conditioners is the heat pump and the other is just an air conditioner. But it depends upon how the manufacturers put it together. But understand your air conditioners and your heating systems. Now, you could have a propane furnace, right? That is your primary heating system. And so that's going to pull off your propane system. You want to get in there. If you've got filters, you want to get in there and clean out them filters. Make sure that they're not clogged up with a bunch of dust and, and dirt and, and things like that. Maybe take a look at your registers and your floors. Make sure you keep them clean. On your ceiling, on the inside of your RV, Usually they have some kind of filter in them and I take ours down and clean them every once in a while. If they get dirty 
and get dirt up in them, you could end up with condensation when they're running and then they'll drip water. So you got to get up there and, and keep them cleaned out. But it's some things to think about with your air conditioning and heat system. And uh, our built-in fireplace is, is electric heater. And I take it apart, pull it out, and I get in there with a vacuum cleaner and clean it out once in a while. So it's just something to think about. And I'm going to give you a tip at the end of this on maintaining a maintenance log and maintenance schedule and i'll give you a, a sneak peek of what we use what i've come up with next thing i'm going to talk about is your slide systems now some rvs don't have any slides I mean, if you've got an airstream you don't have slides if you've got a small rv um, a small uh, retro rv you may not have any slides, but let me tell you, on these big motorhomes and these big RVs, you could have five slides on these things. Now, we only have three, and there are different types of slides. One of them is called a Swintec type of a slide, or your main slides could be what they call a rack and pinion. Um, there's another one that all, all uses a cable system. I'm not sure that they use the cable system anymore, but they still might. But the slide systems, you want to make sure you understand uh, the different kind of slides that you have. And make sure you keep things away from that slide when it comes in and goes out. You don't want them things jamming up. Um, the Swintec system is, it has a separate controller. And it also has air codes. And it has little motors that drives that slide in and out. And I would research on the Swintec system, understand it. Understand the controller and the error codes that might come up on it. Uh, understand how that if the Swintec system fails, how are you going to get that slide in to be able to travel? Uh, you obviously can't go down the road with a slide out. So on our unit, the bedroom is a Swintec slide. The two main slides are a rack slide and, and you can get underneath there and you can see them big long tubes with the gears on them. And the motors that drives on them gears is underneath the RV and you can't see them because most RVs you, you've got what's called a core plast or a big plastic sheet that seals the bottom of it. And you gotta, if you've got a problem with one of them, you gotta get in there and take that down. You can get up into the motors and see what's wrong with it. My advice is just keep them clean. Uh, find out and learn what the maintenance procedures are for your slides. Some don't require any lubrication at all. Some just make sure that it's clean. But understand your slides. Understand the mechanisms that move the slides. And if you have a problem, how do you override the system to get that slide in? Now, on our main slides, the rack slides, there's a a manual crank procedure that you can stick in there and crank the slide in by hand if the motors don't work. So on the Swintec slide, it's much more difficult. Uh, if you got a problem with one of them Swintec slides, you got to get in there and pull the motors out of the track and they're very hard to get to. And then you got to try to push the slide in manually. But understand when you do that, <clears throat> you got to lock that slide in so don't come back out. So read up on your slide systems, read up on the maintenance procedures, read up on the troubleshooting procedures, understand that if you have a problem with your slide, how do I manually get that slide in so that I can hook up and go down the road and get it to a, uh, somebody that can fix it. But I'm just telling you, read up on your slide systems, read up on the maintenance, the overrides, look at your slide systems every once in a while on the seals that go around the slide. Every once in a while, you're going to have to get in there and use, uh, it's not a lubricant, it's a treatment on the rubber seals to make sure that they don't crack, dry out, crack, rot, and then you end up with leaks, right? So find out about the treatment of your rubber seals that go around your slides, and you're going to have to do maintenance on it 
Um, I do ours once a year. I clean them and then I put a treatment on them that keeps the seal soft so they don't get real hard and crack and break and, and come off. <clears throat> so that's what I would recommend you do on your slide systems. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the safety systems that, that's built into these RVs. The alarms, a carbon dioxide alarm, a propane alarm, smoke detectors, those kind of things. <clears throat> and your emergency exits to get out of the RV. Know where those are, and some of them will have those little 9-volt batteries in them, just like your house. Change them batteries once a year. Now, usually the propane alarm and the carbon dioxide alarm is hardwired to your 12-volt system, so it's always on. Uh, that, that's kind of a federal guideline, I, I believe. But that alarm is always on. But there's an expiration date on them. you got to look at those and find out when they expire because you got to replace them. They're not good forever. I just had to replace hours after three years. It, it's coming up on its expiration date, and I didn't want the thing beeping in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning and us running around on our PJs trying to figure out what, what's wrong. So take a look at your safety systems. Take a look at your alarms. Most of these smoke detectors, you know how they do. They'll beep when the battery gets low. But we go through and we change the batteries in the smoke detectors. We keep an eye on the carbon monoxide and the propane connect, uh, propane sensor. And we change them whenever we need to. Uh, the emergency escape windows. We check those every once in a while just to make sure they're still in good shape. Now, we don't always open them to check them. But we do take a look at them to make sure that they're the seals around them are still good and they're not uh, the little uh, emergency levers are still in good shape. Um, fire extinguishers. Now, typically when you buy these RVs, you may have only, you may only come with one fire extinguisher. I would buy some more. I mean, we have them all over the place. You know, I carry one in the truck. I carry uh, like a three pound right here by our exit door. <clears throat> I carry two more in the cargo hold, uh, one on each side, so I can get at them really fast. So I would advise you to take a look at your fire extinguishers and add some. Keep up with the expiration dates of your fire extinguishers. Take them out of their holders and, like, turn them upside down or, you know, shake them a little bit to keep that, whatever type they are, to keep that powder in them. Uh, from clumping up. But take a look at your fire extinguishers. Keep up with the dates on them. Uh, keep up with your, your different smoke detectors and your sensors and your propane things. Uh, those are the kind of things that you want to keep up to date on. If for some reason, worst case scenario, you start having a, a smoke or a fire get out. Don't mess around with, you know, trying to put a fire out in these RVs because I'm telling you, they'll go up like a matchstick. Just get out of it um, the fastest way that you can. Maybe even practice. Now, in the other video, I was telling you about that little fire uh, emergency escape window up there in our bedroom. That would be hard for me and Tammy to get out of it. And it, it's like a 10-foot drop from that window to the ground. But think about it, right? Maybe go through a little mock drill, right? In most cases, I can open the window and, and push the screen out and, and we'll get out of it. But take a look at your safety systems, make sure they're up to date and keep an eye on them is, is all I'm saying. Okay? Uh... The next thing I'm going to talk about is a maintenance log or a checklist. And I'm going to show you what I use to keep track of the maintenance that we do on our RV. So stay tuned. Okay, after talking to you about all these systems, how do you keep track of all this stuff? 
Well, I've come up with our own maintenance checklist by year, and I keep it uh, in a binder. And as we go through and, and check things and do maintenance on it, then I write it down, check it off on our list. And there's things on it like refrigerator, microwave, stove top and oven, roof vents, miscellaneous checks inside. And this is kind of what it looks like. It's just an Excel spreadsheet that I've put together to keep track of the maintenance that we've done on it. Now, you can find these online. Uh, there are databases and websites that, that has a checklist uh, in, in with them. And it, it, some of them will even send you an email that tells you when you need to do something. But come up with some kind of a log. Come up with some kind of a way to keep track of the maintenance that you have performed on your RV. Every time that I repack the wheel bearings, I write down the mileage. I write down, you know, the month and, and the year that I've done it. I can always go back to my maintenance logs and find out when was the last time I checked something. And so something to think about whenever we do a modification or we install another option, I write down on the maintenance check that when we install that option, uh, an example, we added a water softener to our RV. And so on the maintenance log, I wrote down when we installed the water softener, how often we regenerate it, how often we do a back flush on it. When I change the water filters, I put it on the maintenance log. So we know exactly when we've changed the filter, when we added the water softener, the last time that we regenerated it, and things like that. It comes in really handy when you, you want to keep track of the things that you did. If you've treated your seals around uh, your slides, write down on your maintenance checklist when you treated those seals. Uh, if you've got a lead acid battery and you check the water level in it, write down on your maintenance uh, checklist when you check the water and if you added water to it. If you uh, have taken all those out and put in a, a lithium battery bank, uh, I would write that down. When you bought the batteries, when you installed them, uh, when you did modifications to your solar package, all those kind of things, you write down on your maintenance checklist so you can keep track of it. Um, it's just a real good idea to keep track of, of the maintenance that you've done on your RV. And each year when we come, you know, each year what comes around when we've got our maintenance list, I three hole punch it and I stick it in a book. So I can always go back four years and find out when I installed something or when I last did something comes in handy too if you want to sell the RV you can give those maintenance sheets you can show them to a prospective buyer and show them that yeah you've taken pretty good maintenance of this this RV so there's several uses for a maintenance checklist and like I said you can find them online you can create your own um, like I said there's some systems that will even send you an email when you're supposed to do something so it's a really good idea to come up with a maintenance checklist. List all the major systems. List the things that you would normally check with, with that system, like your safety systems. When did you change the batteries? Uh, when did you last took a look at, at your propane or your carbon monoxide and either cleaned it, checked it, what's the expiration date, those kind of things. Uh, it's really a good idea to have a maintenance checklist of, of things that you've done. So that's all I'm saying about that. Just a really good idea. So I understand, you know, we're not perfect, right? It's just some of the things that we've learned over the last four years in full timing. And let me tell you, the more you inform and the better prepared you are and the better planning that you have done, you're going to have a much better experience. The more fun you're going to have, the more memories you're going to make, the happier everybody's going to be. So take some time, <clears throat> learn about your rig, learn about the maintenance, learn about the systems, 
And just be prepared that when you go out, if something happens, you can take care of it. You know, maybe you troubleshoot it and fix it. Your planning and your trips can be just much better, much better experience. So I hope this has helped you. I hope I've given you some information, um, you know, turns the light bulbs on, make sure you're aware of some of the things you're going to run into. But the main thing is go out and have fun, go out and, and make a lot of memories with, with the family and just enjoy the RV experience. That's what it's all about. Believe me. So Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching this long-winded thing. If you gain some information out of it, great. So, so long. We'll see you on the next video, and thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.